when um, in June, Roger Gloss came and he spoke about if pigs could talk. And he wrote this, this book, which I bought, and it really turned me around. I had heard about um, uh, the cruelty to animals and to the environment uh, because of the way we eat. And so I got this book and I thought, wow. And he had talked about becoming a vegan. And at that time I thought, ew. Um, but after I read this book, I thought, well, gosh, I can do that. And I did. So for the last three months, I have been a vegan. And it's just not that hard. All you need is a little imagination. Okay, so he wrote uh, If Pigs Could Talk, and at that time, in 2017, there were 7 billion people in the world, and in 2180 years, when I'm 160 years old, there'll be 11.2 billion people in the world. And how are we going to feed all them? We already were extremely cruel to animals and to the environment. Uh, now, 99% of farm animals are raised on factory farms. Before, you know, you had a little family farm and you had 25 or 50 cows or something like that and they walked around on the grass and, and life was pleasant and they lived to be about 20 years old. Uh, well, now the factory farms have come in and uh, thrown all of the small farmers out of business. A lot, uh, if you look, um, there's a lot of suicide among farmers in the Midwest because they've lost their family farms that have been in their families for generations. So the factory farms come in. A factory farms, it's a large industrial oper operation that uh, raises large numbers of animals for food, which focus on profit and efficiency at the expense of animal welfare. So there's all of these animals crowded into these small spaces because it costs a lot of money to give them space that have room around and eat a lot of food. Um, so we're going to go to, we're going to talk about cattle. I learned so much. You'd think I was raised on a farm. Uh, there are beef breeds and there are dairy breeds, and they don't always go together. So beef breeds, let's take a look at them. Here's, um, this is a factory farm, and look at this guy, he get me out of here, help. Oh, yeah. So that's one of the things that they crowd them together. Factory cows are slaughtered when they're 14 to 16 months old. So if you live on a factory farm, if you're a cow on a factory farm, you get to live up to about 16 months. If you were a local farmer where you're out there with raising in the grass with all your friends and everything, you could live four to five years before the farmer would cut you up and eat you. Regular lifespan of a cow is 20, 22 years. To grow to 1,200 pounds, these cows are stuffed with fast food, which is supplemented with additional protein and growth hormones. And this fast food causes health problems, so they are fed antibiotics. So you are what you eat. So the cow is eating um, the additional protein, growth hormones, and antibiotics, and now you're eating the cow. Bon appetit. Here's the cows. That are, they're just walking around, but this is the factory farm, and they're just herding the cows around to get them over to where they're going to put them in a pen like this, where they can't turn around or sit down, uh, nothing. They're just there, and they're eating this. Uh, they get to eat and, and stand there for 16 months. Um, they're raised on a concrete slab when they're in that, that last picture, no bigger than their body, and they never touch grass. Here their diet changes to one of mostly grain, which can cause digestive issues and pain and even death. So imagine if you were allergic to something and that's the only thing you, you were given to eat, and you know you either starve or you eat that stuff, it's just going to cause you to have your stomach upset. That's the life of a cow, a, a beef cow. Here they are, where they, at least these guys are outside, they get to see the sun, but they're packed in there again. So um, what happens in the factory farms is that their diseases abound. We've all, um, they're called CAFOs, this concentrated animal feeding operation is a factory farm, that's what they call them, CAFOs. E. coli abounds. We've all heard of E. coli that comes and, and people do um, survive that. But MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, um, that, uh, that's a little harder because that's um, uh, resistant to most of antibiotics. So that's uh, much more deadly. Mm -hmm. um, salmonella, we hear salmonella coming out all the time. That's a foodborne illness. Now, mad cow, I did not misspell awful. Awful is the stuff that's left over when they kill the cow and all this stuff comes out, the dead cow. 
Okay, that's awful, and awful is awful. <laughs> okay, and what they do is they grind that up and they put it in with the grain that they feed to the cows. So if there's disease in those cows, then uh, you get this, uh, the bad cow, and that's why it gets to be such a, a tremendous problem. And the reason they put obesity in here is because it's recognized as a disease. And, you know, if you go on a diet, you go down to 1,200 calories, they tell you to have a piece of meat as big as a deck of cards. Well, when you go to a restaurant, you get a steak that's like a pound. You know, this, this is like four ounces, but you get a pound. Uh, you go for prime rib and it's eight ounces or 32 ounces. I mean, you can get, you know, a giant slab of meat. And people eat that. You know, nothing. You know, one dinner uh, when it should have been six or something. Anyway, so obesity, we eat too much. And let me see, so the next one is, uh, this is the cows just before they go off to slaughter. And see, this one's fallen down because of the, uh, of the awful food they feed them. And but look at, they're all dirty and yucky, and cows don't, cows don't like that. So uh, they're taking them off to kill them. And the way they kill them is that they shoot them in the head. But if they don't, if they shoot them in the head and they don't quite die, which could happen, then they drag it over here and they throw it in a steam bath, a, 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 a scalding hot water, and they kill it slowly. Lots of these animals are not, you know, they're supposed to be killed instantly, and they're not. They're killed slowly in many cases. Next time, next time you go out for a steak, doesn't that look delicious? Okay. Remember, this is where it came from. Uh, animals run no risk of going to hell. They're already there. <coughs> okay, so um, now we're just going to dairy cows. Dairy cows are, lead horrible lives. They're filled with grief and pain and suffering. Horrible lives. This is what a dairy cow should look like. This is what it, uh, it should look like, but it doesn't. Starting from age 15 months, she will usually be artificially inseminated and again three months after giving birth forced into a narrow trap commonly called the rape rack. When she gives birth, her calf will be removed within 36 hours so the farmers can sell her milk. Strong bond between cow and calf is formed quickly after birth. Following that callous separation, the mother will bellow and scream for days. Where's my baby? Give me back my baby. If the calf is female, she will face the same cycle of hell that her mother is trapped in. So she'll start being artificially inseminated. And what is artificial insemination? Okay, here you go. You got the cow backed up to you, and it's in the rape rack, so it can't move, can't kick you or anything. You pull the cow's tail up, and you stuck your arm, stick your arm in there. See, they're sticking their arm in there. And then you take this long tube, and the reason you stick your arm way in there is because you've got to get down to the uterus and tip it up so that when you stick this uh, tube with a sperm in it, it will go into the uterus and impregnate the, uh, the cow. That's um, uh, starting from age 15 months, she will usually be artificially inseminated and restraining, restraining apparatus used is commonly called the rape rack. That's what they do on factory farms. Okay, now, she's had her calf. They've taken it away from her. She's really sad, and so they put her in this thing like this. Now, this is where there's milking machines down here, and she gets milked uh, and um, take your milk taken away from her. If this cow was on a regular farm, this is what it would look like. If the cow is on a factory farm, it's like this. This cow can give 22,000 pounds of milk a year. This one gives 10,000 pounds of milk a year. And uh, I wonder how that happens. Okay, they're raised on a concrete slab in a, bar a stall barely bigger than their body. They never touch grass or see the sun, they're inside. Their diet changes to one of mostly grain, which caused digestive issues, pain, and death. Hooves rot black from standing in their own excrement. The teats become scarred, swollen, and leaking from, nearly, from giving nearly 22,000 pounds of milk a year. That's more than double what your forebears produced 40 years ago. At four years of age, the cow's bones are so brittle that they often snap and leave the cow unable to get up off the ground. That's called a downer cow. The downer cow, cow is unable to stand on its own due to injury or illness. And these, the federal government says, these aren't fit for human consumption. Guess what? 
three times they are used. Three times likelier to harbor potentially deadly strain of E. coli and at higher risk of carrying salmonella bacteria and tra transmitting bovine spongiform <coughs> encephalopathy or mad cow disease. Big meat will hit the cow in the eyes with a cattle prod or in the groin, stick a fire hose down its throat to get to, to stand, and if all else fails, they'll hoist the cow with the forklift and load it onto the flatbed truck bound for slaughter. They're not supposed to do that, but they do. Factory farm carry cows live four to five years. The normal lifespan of a cow is 20. So four to five years, so uh, the cow has, uh, gives birth every year and then gets raped and, and gets pregnant and gives birth to another cow every year for four or five years. And then it's shipped off to be slaughtered and uh, that may be your state. Often suffering from painful udder infections, mastitis, and osteoporosis, spent cows suffer greatly during transport to slaughterhouses. Many are not even able to stand up. So this is, this is that's, it's not supposed to look like that. That's not good. Veal, okay. So we had the beef cows and we have the dairy cows. So the dairy cows give birth to a little male cow. Well, what are you going to do with it? You shoot it or toss it in a bin. Because what good is a male dairy cow? Can't give meals, can't get pregnant. <coughs> it's sold to be raised for veal, which delays his death by just a matter of months. So they take this little baby calf that's, uh, that's crying for his mom, and uh, the abuse of killing a calf. Approximately half of all calves born are males, so there's a lot of them, for which dairy operations have no use. Males produce no milk and are not economical to raise. They can't uh, spend a lot of money to raise them. Uh, calves raised for veal are forced to spend their short lives in individual crates that are no more than 30 inches wide and 72 inches long. These crates are designed to prohibit exercise and normal muscle growth in order to produce tender gourmet veal. You know, when you see veal in the meat market, you see that it's kind of pink and regular beef is bright red. So the pig, then, they're fed a milk substitute that is purposely low in iron so that they will become anemic and their flesh will stay pale. Because of these extreme unhealthy living conditions, calves raised for veal are susceptible to long uh, to diseases, uh, including chronic pneumonia and diarrhea. Okay, one more thing they do to the poor little calf: they castrate it. They don't give it a shot of Novocaine or nothing. They just take this thing and take the uh, and castrate it so that it'll produce more tender flesh. Aren't you glad you get tender veal? <laughs> okay, what about pigs? <laughs> Pigs have it good, don't they? Nope. Okay, here's some pigs, and uh, these are mother pigs. And mother pigs get their own little space, and here's another mother pig, and she's about to give birth, and uh, you know, they've got her on a nice bed here. <laughs> and uh, uh, since they're, they're so crowded in there, a lot of the little pigs die. They don't make it. So they just, the farmer just comes along and picks them up and throws them in a bin. Uh, now here's, if you're not a mother cow, uh, pig, then you're kept in pens like this. Okay, the thing that happens in pens like this is that if you were all crowded together in some small place and you, you keep bumping into people, you get out of my way, get out of my moves and move. So what they do is these pigs become feral and they get really, really angry. And so they bite each other's tails off. So the farmer had an idea, I'll show them. So he, he cuts the pig's tails off himself. Like with that castrate thing, they just cut the pig's tails off, so we'll have, we'll have no more of that. And to ensure that they'll have no more of that is they take the little baby's teeth out so they can't chew the tails off. Uh, good friends. Okay, so let's talk, talk about chickens. This is something else I didn't know before. You got fryers and you got layers. Okay, so let's look at the fryers. Okay, 20,000 are kept at a time in one, in, in one barn. Okay, here they are, 20,000. And this isn't looking down like this, this is looking straight up. So these poo on these, and these poo on these, these poo on these, so uh, it's not really a, a wonderful thing to be uh, caged. So California, a couple years ago, came out with this thing, and they showed pictures like this of the caged animals. So um, they said, come on, we gotta have free range. So the farm uh, factory said, okay, we'll do free range. Here you go. <laughs> That's free range. 
they get, you know, it's, uh, at, at least they're not uh, pooping on top of each other. Um, okay, now here's, in 1950, this is a chicken that's 68, uh, in, in 68 days. This, today, this is a chicken in 47 days. Isn't it strange how upset people get about a few dozen baseball players taking growth hormones when we're doing what we're doing to our food animals and feeding them to our children? Come on, Johnny, get your, have your chicken. Okay, chickens also become feral, so, uh, and they pick at each other, so the farmer figured out a way to fix that, too. He takes their little beaks off. Okay, we'll show you, you're not, you're not going to do that. Okay, so now, how to slaughter a chicken. Uh, oh, young, my mom had a friend, we lived in a small town in Iowa, and my mom had a friend that lived on a farm, so we went out to visit the friend. And we're out there, and my mom says, you want to have some chicken for lunch? And I said, sure. So she goes out in the barnyard, and she picks up this chicken by its legs, and she swings it over her head until she hears the chicken's neck uh, break. And then she goes over to this, there's this tree stump, and she puts the chicken down on the tree stump, and there's a hatchet there, and she whacks it like that. And then she lets the chicken go, and the chicken goes amok for like about 50 yards or something. That's how you kill a chicken on the farm. So there was this guy that, um, he, was, he was trying to kill a chicken and he whacked it like that and he just missed the, the, the brain stem and he ended up with a headless chicken. So he thought, boy, I got a deal. Uh, so he went into town and he says, uh, if you guys buy me a beer, I'll show you a headless chicken. And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, he got really drunk that night showing his chicken around. So there was this promoter there and um, he said, well, well, let's do something with it. So they started taking the chicken around uh, uh, to these Mike the Headless Chicken Festival. They had chicken dance contests, games like pin the head on the chicken, a five kilometer race, run like a headless chicken, uh, and of course, many chicken dishes. And one night, they'd been doing this for like a couple of years, and the chicken was kind of acting funny. And so in order for the chicken, what they had to do to keep the chicken alive is they had to, they had a little syringe and they had to clean the mucus out of the, the hole that was where its head was. And they had left the uh, syringe back home or something and uh, they couldn't clean it out so the chicken died. And that farmer, I bet he killed 500 chickens trying to find another one where he'd get just the right amount of uh, uh, brain stem left. So anyway, this is how they kill the chickens now. They hang them up like this, they put them on a conveyor belt, and there's a uh, razor. So as it goes along like this, it, it, it takes their head off. Now, if by some chance the chicken goes like this and misses the razor, where they go from here is to, to scalding hot water, and so they, uh, they die anyway. So that's how they kill the chickens. Okay, now here's something that you need to watch for. If you want antibiotic chicken thighs from Whole Field Foods, which is labeled no added solutions or injections, they're $2.49 a pound. However, Purdue's Harvest Land branded chicken thighs will cost you over $1.99 a pound. The reason that's significant is the chicken purchased at Whole Foods was raised by Purdue farmer and slaughtered at the same Purdue plant as the Harvest Land counterpart. So they tell you that they're organic and um, uh, they're antibiotic free, but you need to look, um, you need to look it up. Uh, okay, here's the layers. We're gonna talk about layers. Here's the, the layers in a, in a cage. So we said, oh no, you can't keep them in a cage. That's just awful, you've gotta give free range. So the farmer said, sure, no problem. Here's cage free. 20,000 chickens in one building and that's cage free, and we let that happen. And the males in layers, you know, male chicks can't go up to, to lay eggs. And so the males are put to death in a grinder on their first day of life. So here they are going down the little conveyor belt into a grinder where they're killed and thrown away. That or um, sometimes what they do is they put them in a big plastic bag and just suffocate them all. So it kills millions of chickens every week millions every week by throwing them alive in the grinding machines and garbage bags. So it's not fun to live on a factory farm. Okay, the farm, factory farms produce organic, so organic eggs, like Eglin's Best, Horizon Organic, Land O'Lakes, Whole Foods, 
Trader Joe's, those are all considered organic. But there's this list, and I got this off of the <coughs> internet, and anybody can get this. This is from the Cornucopia Institute. And the Cornucopia Institute gives ratings to different kinds of eggs. You can get a five egg, like five star, a five egg rating if everything is just absolutely perfect. The chickens are just in hog heaven over there. They even have spa treatments. It's wonderful. That's a five egg rating. <laughs> then there's a four egg rating, and it's pretty wonderful, but they don't get the spa treatment. So then there's a three egg rating, and the three egg rating is yeah, it's not so it's not so that wonderful. And a two egg rating is down a little further. But a one egg rating um, is the people that do the one egg rating are Safeway, Kroger, Target, Aldi, Sprouts, Trader Joe's, uh, Whole Foods, Walmart, and Costco are some of the ones. And you can get this. These are all the one egg ones. But the five egg ones, I look at the five egg ones and um, they're like 20 bucks a dozen. But at least the chickens are happy. So you can, you can, I'll leave this out if you, you, you can look at it. But you think you're getting uh, organic eggs? No. -uh. So now we come to the lagoons. So you've got these big farms with all of these, uh, with all of these animals in, and all these animals poo. So what you gonna do? Lagoons, that's got to be the greatest euphemism of all time. These things are cesspools. They're full of feces and urine, occasionally dead pigs, and whatever else gets stuck in there. The way the farmers dispose of the manure in these lagoons is by spraying it into the air, in many cases, in these huge manure cannons, which look like long lawn sprinklers. Okay, so um, here's, here's a lagoon, and here, they're pulling some of it up, and they're going to spray it out to fertilize the field. Okay, but you're next door and you're digging your laundry out. <laughs> you just say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so they spray it. Now they can't spray all of this on there because the, the uh, crop could just take so much manure and then, you know, it doesn't need any more. So they got to figure out something else to do with the rest of this manure. And there's lots of it. Now here's another, these are lagoons. And here's another one. These are lagoons. They got to figure out something to do with all of that manure. And you think, oh, you're safe. You're not close to any of those manure places. Nobody spraying booze, uh, poo around me. Okay. Yes, they are. The better it is, the more the more poo there is in your area. Okay. No, so look at us. Huh? I said, look at us. Yeah, yeah. There's farms all along here, and there's there are statistics on this, like. Uh, but there's one of these areas, I think they, it was Tulare County area, where it has, the, the cow poo is five times what all of the uh, uh, waste is in New York. <laughs> so, um, the, the, there's just a lot of waste and they don't know what to do with it. However, there's one thing that they're doing, is they're covering over this thing with plastic and they're collecting the methane gas which is wonderful, except that collecting the methane gas is not very cost effective and it's not as good as regular gasoline, so they're, they're still working on that. It's not that. Uh, they're, they're trying a bunch of other things of what to do with, uh, with all that poop. When you go to Home Depot and you get a plant and it's in this kind of earthen loop, that's poo. That they, that they sanitized and they put together and made it into a, a little pot. So. Um, they're, they're, they're trying. The future environmental issues. Okay. In 1812, there were 1 billion people. A hundred years later, there were 1.5 billion. Not that many more. But in 2012, there were 7 billion. We're growing faster than exponentially. Okay. And so where's all that waste going to go? Well, they're working on it. Uh, this, this, they're working on this too. Animal agriculture water consumption ranges from 34 to 76 trillion gallons annually. Uh, agriculture is responsible for 80 to 90 percent of the U.S. water consumption, and growing feed crops for livestock consumes 56 percent of the water. So, when we're having this drought, um, yeah, um, that's where a lot of the water is going. We have to keep the animals alive. Um, 
Livestock is responsible for 65% of all human-related emissions of not nitrous oxide, not carbon dioxide, but nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas with 296 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. That's pretty scary. And which stays in the atmosphere for 150 years. They haven't figured out a way to break that down. Emissions for agriculture projected to increase 80% by 2050. That's only 30 years away. See, 30 years, I'll be 110. Um, <laughs> cows produce 150 billion gallons of methane a day. All of that, a day, a day. Okay, then let's look at the forest. Forests cover 30% of the Earth's land. Agriculture is the leading cause of deforestation. And one and, a half, one and a half acres of forest is cut down every second. So here's a map. And look at all these red areas is where the forests are gone. Uh, uh, that's not very helpful. Even though it's down here, uh, it's, you know, if, they have, if it affects them, it's going to affect us. So they got to put cut down the forest. Not too long ago, rainforest covered 14% of the Earth's mass, and today cover only 6%, so uh, over half. Many experts report that rainforests could be completely wiped off the map in approximately 40 years. So, um, but we're, we're seeing it, we're, they're working on it. <laughs> Living, okay. So veg vegans, veg vegetarians and vegans are increasing throughout the world, like the Danes, 20% are eating less meat. New Zealand, it went from 1.5% to 10% in 2016. Vegan and vegetarian restaurants in Spain has doubled. We've, we're starting to get a few vegan and vegetarians. A whopping one in eight British adults now follows the vegetarian, but their food wasn't that good anyways. Nearly <laughs> uh, 10% of Sweden identifies as vegetarian. The Indian city, Palatine, became the first all vegetarian city in the world. But now India, you know, the top half of India is either ve uh, vegetarian or East meat, I can't remember. One, one, the top does one and the bottom half of the uh, country does something else. But one of them was already, so this was probably already in a vegetarian area. Germany is home to over 7 million, so Germany's getting it. Uh, how will you get enough protein? So I'm watching Stephen Colbert this one night and Woody Harrelson is on. And Stephen finds out that Woody is a vegan and he says, well, how are you going to get enough protein uh, on a vegan diet? And Woody says, well, look at this guy. <laughs> He's never eaten meat. He doesn't go down to GNC and get protein shakes. He doesn't need vitamins. And look at how, how big and strong and wonderful he is. And also, if you look at horses and cows and buffalo, they're all vegans. And they're doing just fine. So you can get a, a vegetarian lack, diet like sufficient protein, calcium, no, no. It's it, it well, well balanced. There's a lot of protein in vegetables. They only eat salad. They have a variety of meals from vegetable top pizza, pasta primavera to succulent stir fries. I eat very, uh, a lot of varied foods, and, and uh, uh, it hasn't been that hard not to eat meat. Um, being a vegetarian is time consuming and difficult, only if you have no imagination. Okay, so uh, I saw this recipe for eggplant bacon. And you slice the eggplant really thin, and you soak it in uh, liquid smoke and, and um, um, soy sauce. And then you bake it in the oven. Okay, and take it out and you make yourself a BLT. It was delicious. It didn't taste like bacon, but it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried it with portobello mushrooms, and again, it was delicious, but uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite get that bacon feeling. Um, Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods are releasing plant-based burgers that they claim not only smell and taste like meat, but look, handle, and cook like meat. Um, they created a meat taste from the plant proteins by concentrating heme protein, which gives red meat its color. Okay, so uh, Albertsons has an ad in their ad this week for uh, Beyond Meat, and I was up at Ralph's and I got some Beyond Meat. And so you get this little package and it's eight ounces, two four ounce patties, and it was six bucks. So it's not cheap. So I take it home and I fry up the first patty, and 
One of the things they did is they put a little oil in there, so when it fries, it releases a little oil, and it looks like looks like a hamburger. Somebody came in your kitchen and says, "Oh, you fry hamburgers?" Yes, I am. Um, so, uh, the, and I tasted it, and the taste is <coughs> consistency is one thing. Like a lot of people don't like liver because of the consistency; it just doesn't taste fun, fun in your mouth. But hamburger tastes fun in your mouth. Okay, so this Beyond Burger, it tasted it tasted like it felt like hamburger in my mouth, and it tasted okay, but it was off a little. But there was this smell. <laughs> There's this this funny smell. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. You should try it. Yes. <laughs> uh, and maybe maybe it won't bother you. But it tasted it tasted uh, you know it was like eating a hamburger. So anyway, they're coming along. They may have to come along a little bit further to get to get me back there. Bill Gates and Asia's richest businessman, Li Keqing, because that sounds like Keqing, 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 have invested 23 million because they're trying to get the plant-based food out there. And you know, um, we've come a long way with milk. Like almond milk is selling more than uh, than, than regular milk, and uh, you can use it almost the same algae. Um, it's the bottom of the food chain. It can feed humans and animals and can be grown in the ocean, a big wilderness with land and fresh water in an increasingly short supply. Okay, here's the problem. There's no large sale commercial endeavor to make seaweed edible. At this point, it's not edible. So Kishing and, uh, and, and what's his name? Gates. Need, to, need, need to, to start working on that. Seaweed is the fastest growing plant, so it grow two feet in, uh, in a day. So we could grow lots and lots of it. It could be worked into our diet without us really knowing. It's like there's a lot of mothers now that have these uh, cookbooks that tell you how to, to um, pulverize broccoli or Brussels sprouts and put it in their mashed potatoes or cookies or whatever. And they, they fool the kids. And the kids don't realize they're eating their vegetables. Um, so they could, they could mush this seaweed up into, into your food. It could be, um, it's such a big resource we really haven't tapped into yet. There's 10,000 types of seaweed. Who knew? Okay, let's go to edible insects. And you're going to say, ew, I would never eat an insect. Never, ever, ever. Ew. Okay, frozen broccoli, this is the food guidance for you. Frozen broccoli, you could have insects, you could have up to 60 per 100 gram. I don't know how much 100 gram is, but you can have 60. Somebody sits there and counts them. Cinnamon, insect filth, you know, their legs fall off, and insects poop. Uh, 400 or more fragments per 50 grams of cinnamon, okay, and rodent filth. In macaroni, insect filth, there's uh, 25, 225 fragments per 225 grams, so, okay, so one per gram. But mushrooms, this is the one that gets me, 20 or more maggots per 100 grams and 75 mites per 100 grams. So, so you guys are eating bugs We're now. Eating, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, so here, if you take these mealy worms and you grind them up and put them in your meatloaf, or make meatloaf out, the protein content is the same as beef. So these have the same protein content as beef. There's more vitamin B12 than in eggs. And they're looking at this potential therapeutic compounds for Alzheimer's disease. They're working on that. Vitamin B5 for your skin, choline for your liver, phosphorus for your teeth and bones, more fiber than broccoli, and essential amino acid profile of tofu. So all that from mealworms. And it's coming. There's roughly 1,900 insect species are good for people to eat. Like, don't you see something crawling on the ground? Don't pick it up and eat it. <laughs> uh, mealworms and superworms are rich in protein and amino acids. Vitamins and minerals like potassium and iron, plus they have less fat and cholesterol than beef. Okay, so bugs are good to for you. <laughs> Here's nutrition facts for cricket flour. I was watching uh, Shark Tank one night, and this kid came on, and he's selling. He's trying to get uh, some money raised to continue with his cricket flour that he's using and making into protein bars. So um, uh, Mark Cuban gave him fifty thousand dollars to help to help him that I guess some other people did too because he's he's going along. And so in the nutrition facts, it's got uh, cricket flour has fifteen percent protein. So 
Uh, I don't know whether they're going to cook something just with protein, with just with cricket flour or mix the cr cricket flour into something else, whatever. But it's got all these different vitamins and everything. You can buy this stuff on Amazon. You can buy cricket flour, and you can buy dried crickets like these. These are these are dried crickets, and they just taste kind of crunchy. I don't really have a lot of flavor, but if anybody wants to try a cricket, they are up here and you're welcome to try one. The thing is that this, this one, this was ten bucks, and it wouldn't it wouldn't feed anybody a meal. Yeah. They they just don't have production yeah. fast enough yet, so not that not not fast enough. And um, and by the way, vegans can't eat bugs, not on your diet. Their lives they have those bugs have mothers and fathers. So. Oh please. Yeah. Yeah. No, not for vegans. Okay, so um, one night one of the kids uh, brought their friend over for dinner, and he had never seen shrimp before. I was fixing shrimp. So I showed him the shrimp, and he says, oh, it looks like bugs. So which of these are shrimp scampi, and which of these are bugs? Okay, so shrimp scampi, yeah. bugs. These are grubs. One night, I was in a hurry, and I didn't have a lot of time to fix dinner, so I fixed some bacon and eggs, and my husband comes home, and he says, Bacon and eggs for dinner, ooh. And I said, if you were an aborigine out in the, the uh, bush and you ate grubs, would you have to have them for breakfast, lunch, or dinner? You know, so we have all these food hangouts. So these are these are these are bugs, and these are shrimp. They see the shrimp, see the bugs. Okay, what about these guys? Okay, these are now thirty, forty, fifty dollars a pound. In the early 1800s, these uh, lobster were fed to the prisoners and slaves, um, uh, and they rebelled. They got really mad. Don't feed us that lobster anymore. And so it came full circle. It's the other way around now. Only rich people eat lobster. But now you can eat scorpions. This is a this is a scorpion in the in the water. Yes. They, they didn't serve it with butter. <laughs> you, could, you could buy some scorpions, uh, some dead scorpions on Amazon. They're perfectly clean. They have little, these little mini farms now where they're raising bugs in clean conditions. So, um, and so there are a bunch of people that are trying to get bugs out into uh, our uh, diet. So this one is probably like this one was, you know, 200 years ago. And 200 years from now, people will be paying 40, 50 dollars a pound for these guys. <laughs> and you can, you want to taste one? Just go on on um, Amazon and buy one. Um, the FAO reports uh, from ants to beetle larvae eaten by tribes in Africa and Australia as part of their subsistence <coughs> diet to a popular crispy fried. The, I'm saying that wrong. Beetle yes. enjoy it's estimated that insect eating is practiced by a two billion people worldwide. So here is a grocery store in Thailand, and they're they're fixing all these bugs. <coughs> here's another uh, grocery store in Thailand, and here's scorpions on a stick. So I was watching TV the other night, and they were selling these scorpions on a stick, and. Um, um, there are a couple people there, and one guy ate one and says, oh, it's really tasty, it's crunchy and really tasty, and another said, you know, it tastes a little bit like when you fry chicken skin, it tastes a little bit like that, and somebody else said, ew, 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 ew. well, that person's probably going to starve to death in the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, these are maggots, okay, and this is sardinia. Sardinia, as the larvae eat the rotting cheese, it passes through their bodies, and the excretions give the cheese a distinct flavor and texture. The robust Casu Marzu flavor is said to taste akin to ripe gorgonzola. Yay! In reality, you're tasting larvae excrement. Now, yeah. <laughs> get this the cheese is typically eaten when the maggots are still alive, as dead maggots are a sign that it has gone bad. <laughs> Since the maggots are alive and wiggly and can jump to great heights when disturbed, diners need to be mindful of their eyes when eating the delicacy. <laughs> <laughs> oh Anybody want to go to Sardinia? Okay. In this, I was just fascinated with this. 
This is these down in South America. They have grasshoppers like this. So you know, three or four in your plate, and you've got a full meal, right? Okay. And then this guy's not an insect, but I just I had never seen anything like this before, and so I just brought it to show you, just because yeah, I was fascinated that you know you're walking along in this Pacific island, and and this crab comes walking past you. Oh yeah. I don't know whether they eat those or not. Seems like there'd be a lot of meat on them. I think they eat us. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is a, a, one of the innovations that's coming out now. This is called Perfect Day Milk, and it's animal-free. No animal was milked or touched. And this just really un is unbelievable. To do it, the co-founders got a strain of yeast, which they call Buttercup, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They then obtained a cow's DNA sequence, <laughs> had it printed using a 3D printer, and inserted it into a specific location on the yeast. The yeast ferments sugar to make real milk proteins, casein and whey, which are then combined with plant-based fats and nutrients to give milk that's lactose-free. Can you believe that? Who thinks these things up? Perfect Day is said to launch to put plants to launch cheese, yogurt, and ice cream products by the end of 2017, any day now. With milk following later, it will be priced similar to organic dairy, but the company expects to quickly have a lower cost production than milk. So pretty soon we're going to have we're going to be able to have milk that's made in the laboratory. That's just fascinating to me. Several companies are developing a way to produce real meat from animal cells without the need to feed, breed, or slaughter animals. Mm -hmm. So we're coming to that. We may not have to worry about the next four billion people that are coming because we're going to be able to feed them um, this other way. Okay, this is what happens. They got the starter cell off a cow. So one cow would be good. You can keep using, you'd only have, we have one cow in the world. <laughs> starter cells are hard, harvested through a biopsy and placed on very small cell cultures. Step two, the cells need a place to grow on. These are called scaffolds, biodegradable and edible. The starter cells are then placed on the scaffold and the scaffolds are placed into a bioreactor and soaked with in a growth medium which promotes the cell to grow. We now have ultra-thin pieces of cultured meat. The meat is then vacuum packed and sent to the processing plant and there it is in a hamburger. Hmm. And you didn't kill a cow or nothing. So, and this, this is, they've already thought of this, so cows will be available in not too long. And this, the things that they're coming up with, we don't have to worry about cruelty to animals anymore. The scientists who turn fresh out Apple slices into popular convenience food, available ready to eat in grocery stores, schools, cafeterias, and fast food restaurants. Today, described advances in keeping other foods fresh, flavorful, and safe in longer periods of time through the use of invisible, colorless, odorless, tasteless. So has anybody ever had those apple slices? Okay, and did you know that they were coated? The coated. Yeah. Here's the, this, this gets me too. Packaged food and beverage item. A tomato and basil membrane that houses gazpacho. So you take this bacho to, to work in your lunchbox. A chocolate membrane holding hot chocolate. How does it do that? How does it get it hot? Or an orange membrane containing orange juice. You can take, uh, you can put your orange juice in your pocket and go to work. Okay, that's coming. There's a catch-22 for all this. Okay, so the scientists wanting to try something totally different are in a difficult place. They need data to apply for grant money, and they need money to get the grant. So I come up to you and I say, I can show you uh, how you can carry uh, uh, orange juice around in your pocket. Uh, just give me some money so I can develop it. And they say, well, show me the proof of that. And I say, well, I can't prove it until you get some money. Well, get some money and they can. So uh, um, things kind of get held up there. Lab-grown foods will develop and 3D printers and nanopacking will change how food is created and stored. In the world of apps to educate consumers, topics such as food waste, we have a lot of food waste, and GMOs, which is genetically modified organisms, will appear and other apps will be integrated into kitchen appliances. Right now, your refrigerator will tell you when your milk has gone bad or when you need to buy butter. Uh, that's already here. In food service, <coughs> restaurants and bars will embrace technology to improve customer service. They already do that now when you go to a restaurant. They don't have a pad that they write on. They have a little tablet they, that they poke. Okay. And pretty soon, robots will become, will become an over serving your food. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you have to check the robot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what can you do? It's necessary to become aware of what's going on with our animals and with our environment. 
while it is difficult to completely change your eating habits, it isn't that hard to cut down on meat. If you just cut down on meat and dairy, it will help the environment. Challenge your grocery stores whenever you can. If they claim they are selling <coughs> chickens and eggs or wild-caught salmon, look up the brands and find out if it's true. It's online. Look up the brands. Nothing will change if we don't become aware of what's going on around us. Okay, so uh, uh, all of that, Trader Joe's and that, you need to come in with proof from, the, uh, from their computer that they're not doing what's right. So yay! <laughs>